Amen. There's a, a beautiful song that we sing. And uh, it breaks my heart that we sing the song a lot of times only on funerals. And then they sing the song in a funeral and they, they stretch the song out. And then nobody wants to sing it because it's so eight track and it's a stretched out song. And everybody's like waiting for the song to end. shouldn't be sung like that. And um, it's a song that was written by John Newton in 1779. It was a man that used to be a, a slave ship captain. He used to go and get shay, slaves in Africa and bring them to England on, on a ship. and England and America, but I think it was England. He used to bring them through to England on a, on a slave ship. And, and he was involved in the worst possible thing, selling humans, selling people and selling people into slavery. And he was also an alcoholic and a drug addict. And a lot of times he would get completely out of his mind on those ships while the ship was traveling from Africa to England and, 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 and those people in the bottom of the ships were dying and he was high and drunk on the boat selling people and um, the way the true account goes is that he found himself in the middle of a storm one night and the boat was going about to go down it was about to sink in the middle of the storm and on the deck of that boat in the middle of the storm holding onto the mast John Newton repented of his sins and asked God to save him and if God would save him he would serve God in the middle of the ocean God saved John Newton's soul and he wrote the song a man that was the worst of the worst and listen not one of us are angels I know where God took me from I know what I was and it was not pretty listen he took me out of the miry clay out of the slimy pit and out of the iniquity and the sin of my life. I know where God took me from. And John Newton wrote these words. He said, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. It's beautiful. He didn't say that saved a good oak like me. You know, I was good. I gave to charity. And I, no, he said that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. It was grace that taught my heart to fear. To fear what? To fear the living God. Amen. And grace, my fears, relieved, removed. Because when you come to God, you become His child. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Believed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the only way to salvation. Amen. Through many dangers, toils and snares, I have already come. It is grace that has brought me safe to this day. And grace will lead me home to heaven one day. And now he speaks about heaven. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we'll have no less days to sing God's praise than when we'd first begun. When I'm in heaven one day for 10,000 years, I'll have another 10,000 to praise God and worship Him. And I'll be shining in the glory of the garments given to me by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. It's an amazing song. It's a beautiful song. It should never but just be put in the place of a funeral. It should be sung here amongst us as well. Amen. I sing the song oftentimes. It comes to me while I'm driving in the car. And I sing it because through many dangers, toils and snares have already come. It's His grace that's brought me safe this far and His grace will lead me on. Amen. How precious the grace appeared the hour I first believed. So for me, it's an amazing song. And I'd like to ask just two questions this morning as we get into this, this sermon. And the sermon that we're going to be speaking about is the gospel, the beautiful, beautiful message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the first question I want to ask, and I want you to raise your hands, I want to ask this question this morning. Who here this morning knows for a certainty that if you die today, you will go to heaven? Hands up, please. You know for a certainty. Amen. Now I want to ask again. Now this is the next question. And I'll ask maybe one of you, two of you to answer. On what basis, when you appear before God, and He looks at you and says, Why must I let you enter into my kingdom? What will your answer be? Uh, wait, first, Kevin. What will your answer be? Grace. Amen. Somebody else quickly put up your hand. Anybody? What will your answer be? What will your answer be? Because of the blood of Jesus Christ, the presence of Jesus Christ, it comes through with His blood. And the Bible says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. So the blood of Jesus gives us access to 
Amen. That is the perfect answer. So if you ask somebody, if you die tonight, are you sure you'll get into heaven? If the person says they don't know, they're not sure, then that person needs to be led to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If the person says, yes, I am going to heaven, and you ask them, if you stand in front of him and the Lord himself says to you, why should I let you into my kingdom? If they give you an answer, anything other than, because my faith and trust and hope is in Jesus Christ, because he bled and died for me on the cross, and by his blood my sins are forgiven and I am a child of God. If the person gives you any other answer, they need to be led to Jesus. Amen. Amen? Some people think if I live by the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Some people think there's going to be a scale. That if I just do more good works than I have done bad works in my life, then, then I'm going to get into heaven because my good will outweigh my bad. That doesn't exist. Following the golden rule does not exist. Amen? I want to take you through the gospel this morning. Because if God is going to do what He said He's going to do in this church, then you and I need to prepare for what He's going to do. And I'd like to ask another question before I touch the scripture. How many of you in this church, put up your hand quickly, know how to, if you're talking to somebody else, lead them to Jesus? You know why I'm saying lead to Jesus? Because you and I cannot save souls. That work was done by Jesus Himself. For this reason came the Lord Jesus Christ into the world to save that which was lost. To save souls. Amen. We can't save souls. Only He saves souls. But we who have been saved by Him and through Him can lead people to Him that He can save them. Amen. And how do you lead a soul to the Lord Jesus Christ? By explaining to them the gospel. So quickly, hands up. Who of you are ready right now? You, you know that you can lead someone to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's fantastic. That's good. Amen. We're going to go through it. This is the seriousness of this matter. If you read the book of Romans, from Romans chapter 3 up until the end of Romans chapter 8, it's called the Romans Road. And on the Romans Road from chapter 3 to chapter 8, you see the whole plan of salvation laid out. It is the gospel. So when you lead someone to the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to explain to them the gospel. Amen. And it starts at Romans 6. It says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. And right there is presented to all men. The wages of sin is death. The balloon van die sonde is die doet. So in other words, when I go to work, at the end of the month I receive my wages. So for what I did for them, they pay me. In spiritual things and in this life, for what you do, you will get paid. Amen? And the wages of sin is death, for the, sin that souls sh uh, the soul that sins shall die. Amen? But, thank God for that little, that third line, the first word, but. Thank God for but. Amen? If there wasn't a but there, we'd all be lost. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So God has made a way out for us in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. I want to give it to you this way. That if you can just remember five things, you can explain the gospel to somebody else. If you can just, just remember five things, the whole gospel, the whole of Christianity stands on five pillars. Five pillar. The whole thing stands on five pillars. The first pillar, grace. The second pillar, man. The third pillar, God. The fourth pillar, Jesus. And the fifth pillar, faith. Amen. So all you need to do is just be able to look at your hand and remember five things. Amen. So let, I want to explain the gospel to you. So that when this church becomes full. And listen, God's not going to only send people that are already saved and already bakirt and already look pretty. God's going to send people that don't know Jesus, that aren't saved and that need the gospel. Because if God didn't put this church here for that purpose, then I don't understand what purpose God put this church here for. The church is not an old boys club. It's not, a, it's not a display case for holy people. It's not a place just for us who have already accepted Jesus to come. Although it is. It's our home and it's a place for us to be encouraged. But it's not just for that. The church is primarily a place where people can come to find Jesus. It's a hospital. It's a birthing chamber. It's a place where people can come to Jesus. Because listen, when they go past and they drive past and they walk past... Though the sin and the prince of this world wants to blind their eyes, they know the church is on this corner, they see the signs, and they know that the door of grace is open. 
They see it when they walk past. They know it's here. That's how some of you have come to be here because you've seen it. And when you've seen it, what happened? The Holy Spirit said, ooh, try that church. And now you're here sitting here this morning because of that. God's going to do the same thing with sinners as well. God's going to let them walk past, see the church and say, should we try that church? And then when it gets difficult for them and life isn't going well and it feels like they've been pushed down, the Holy Spirit will then again whisper, go to that church. Because God wants souls to be saved, lives to be saved and people to be blessed. Amen. But let's look at this. If you want to lead somebody to Jesus and explain to them what it means to be a a Christian and a child of God. Five pillars. The first pillar, grace. Grace. What does grace mean? The Bible says in Romans 6.23, The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And because heaven is a gift, like any other genuine gift, it cannot be earned or deserved. Amen. No amount of personal effort, good works or religious deeds can earn a place in heaven for you. Listen, because we gave away food and gave away soup, we're not getting into heaven because of what we did that Sunday morning. Do you know that? Do you know that I'm not getting into heaven because I pray and I fast? I'm getting into heaven because God has given it to me as a free gift. By the grace of God, I will get into heaven. Listen to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you are saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So the first thing is all of us who are Christians. I'm not a Christian because I'm such a nice guy. I'm not a child of God because I'm so good and I pray and I give to charity and I pay my tithes. I'm not a Christian because of any of that. I'm a Christian because God made that way open to me and gave it to me as a gift. John 3 verse 16, what does it say? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. It's got nothing to do with me. It's got everything to do with Him. Amen? So the first pillar of the gospel is you don't have to die. You don't have to be a sinner in front of God and be a sinner falling into the hands of an angry God who will punish you. But you can have life and life everlasting. Just stop trying to deserve it yourself. And understand that it's a gift that's given to you. And accept that gift. Amen? So the first thing is this. To be a Christian, it's grace. Then the second thing that we need to look at is man. You and me, man. When I say man, I mean mankind. Men, women, boys, girls, ladies, gentlemen, young, old, all of mankind. We need to discuss the condition of man. The Bible says in Romans 3, chapter 23, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Listen to Ecclesiastes 7.20. Surely there is no one, no, there is no righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. I'm going to ask a very difficult thing now. Quickly put up your hand. Who has never lied? (laughs) My hand's also down. Quickly, who has never taken something they weren't supposed to take? Who's never said a bad word? Who's never lost his temper? Okay, no hands went up. For we all, for we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. Amen? We have all sinned and we've come short of that glory. The Bible says we all have sheep have gone astray. We've gone each one to our own way. And the Father has laid upon the Lord Jesus Christ the iniquity of us all. My sins are placed upon Him. Amen? Listen to Isaiah 53, 6. We all the sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way. 1 Peter 2, 25. For you, for you were all like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Romans 3, 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not even one. Amen. So, the gift of God, salvation and becoming a Christian is free. You can't deserve it or earn it. But... In the eyes of God, I am a sinner. I've fallen short of His glory. There's a separation between the holy God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and me, sinful man. Amen? So let's look at the third part of, the third, third pillar, God. 1 John 4, 8. 
He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Amen? So sometimes people can twist the gospel and say, No, God will forgive me because God is love. I can sin and I can make a mistake. God is love. Listen to Exodus 34, 7. Keeping mercy and loving kindness for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. But he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Let me read that for you again quickly. This is the God that we serve. He keeps mercy and loving kindness for thousands. He forgives iniquity and transgressions and sins. But he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. My God is love. And he so loved the world that he sent Jesus. But if I do nothing about Jesus and remain in my sins. Listen, the condition that you die in is the condition that you step eternal life into. If I die in Christ, I step into eternal life in Christ. I don't like to say the word die because a Christian, when I come to Christ, I'm born again from above. I become spiritually alive in Christ. So I move from this life to life everlasting. I don't actually die. I just step into eternal life. But listen, if I die in death without Christ, then I step into eternity without Christ. Amen? If I die in my sins, I spend eternity judged for my sins. Amen? Do you understand? So God is not going to look at my sins and because He loves me, just excuse my sins. It was God's plan. God is the great architect of salvation. And when he drew up the plan of salvation, it was all fitted together on one cornerstone, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you come to that cornerstone of the Lord Jesus Christ, what happens? When I see his guiltless, innocent, perfect self carrying my sins, I need to do something about it. Because if God's going to accept me in the love that he wants to give me, then I need to do something. I need to confess. I need to say, Lord, I am a sinful man. And Jesus did carry my sins. He who knew no sin became sin for me because of me. So Lord, if I'm going to have your forgiveness, I need to accept something. I need to accept you're not going to agree with my sin. You're not going to smile at me. You're not going to love me and just excuse me. No, you sent Jesus to die for me, so I need to repent of it. Repent. Believe the gospel and be saved. You know what the first words that Jesus spoke was when he started to preach? Repent. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. Repent means to turn from my wicked ways, to turn from my old life, to turn from the things that grieved God and hurt God's heart, to turn from that and look at Jesus and be changed. You know what Christianity really means? Change. Because no man comes to Christ and stays the same. You have to change, otherwise you're not a Christian. Amen? The things I used to do, I do them no more. The things I used to do, I do them no more. The things I used to do, I do them no more. It was a glad day when I was born again. I was born again. I became a new person in Christ Jesus. Amen? God is a righteous judge. He is angry with the wicked every day. Doesn't that speak opposite to a lot of the things that are being preached in the church now? God loves you, brother. Just come forward, follow me in a prayer, and you will inherit the kingdom of heaven, and you can go carry on doing what you've been doing your whole life. God loves you. He wants to bless you. Now, God's a righteous judge. If I come to Jesus, if I come to the blood of His only begotten Son, when He looks at me, He's not going to judge me for my past sins, because those sins were removed by the blood of Jesus Christ. The books and ordinances that were written against me, the Bible says they've been taken and nailed to His cross. When the nails went through his hands, my sins went through there. Boom. Nailed to the cross. And the books against me were, were, were emptied. They were put on the cross. And another book was opened and by the blood of the Lamb of God. My name was written in the Lamb's book of life by his blood. And there it's written there. And when God looks at me, when I step over the Jordan of death into eternity one day, and I look upon him, you know what my heavenly Father is going to see? The blood of Jesus. And the fact that I belong to Jesus Christ. Amen? And as a righteous judge, you'll judge me by the blood of Christ. You'll look at me and say, spotless. Enter into my rest, our good and faithful servant. Amen? But if I enter into his presence covered with the sin and the iniquity of my life, I've often seen it in a vision. 
Where a man has the nicest suit. He's got the Armani and he's got the Prada and he's got the nice shoes. And he's got everything that's awesome. He's got his, his white BMW and he's got his big mansion. And, and when he breathes out his last breath in his big bed, in his big mansion, in his nice clothes and his nice pajama. When he opens up his eyes and stands in front of God for we shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. He's going to look down and he's just going to see tattered garments. He's going to see filthy spotted Dirty clothes of his soul, covered in the iniquity and the filth of his life, if he never knew Christ. Not because he was rich, but if he never knew Christ. Amen? He's going to leave in Armani that looks like it's shining. And when he opens his eyes, he's going to see himself spiritually as God sees him. And God, who is a righteous judge, will judge him according to what he's covered in. He's covered in what he did. And God's going to judge him according to that. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive according to the things done in his body. According to whether he has done good or bad. You're going to receive a reward for what you've done. Amen. So there's two judgments that appear. One where we shall go and one where the sinner will go. Because God does not judge the righteous with the unrighteous and the just with the unjust. God makes a separation between sheeps and goats. The heavenly father does it in the white throne judgment as well. He separates. He doesn't judge among. He won't judge the righteous with the unrighteous. And the just with the unjust. He makes a separation. When they sin, they stand in front of God for judgment for their sins. When we enter heaven one day, we stand in front of the Lord Jesus Christ for the reward for what we've done for him in this life. Amen. Amen. I don't stand in front of him for judgment of salvation because my salvation was already achieved here on earth. I've come to salvation now. I'm a citizen of heaven now. And when I stand in front of the judgment seat of Christ, I'll stand in front of him as his son. And he'll say, you've been faithful over little. I'll appoint you over much. He's given me five talents. When I stand in front of him, I'm going to give him eight. And he's going to be proud of me for those eight and he's going to reward me for those eight i'm not standing in front of jesus for judgment whether i'm entering heaven or not that's already done i stand for reward for what i've done for him and his kingdom amen the bible says that i'm going to quickly add it for every man's work shall be tried as with fire and the day shall reveal it whether that work was done with hay or stubble or wood things that are seen, or whether it was done with the spiritual things of God that are not seen, diamonds and gold and silver and precious things that do not fall away but become better when the fire touches them. Amen. So I receive salvation and I receive being a Christian by grace. I can't earn it. It's given to me by God. I'm a sinful man and I've fallen short of the glory of God. And God is love, but God cannot wink at sin. He's going to have to judge me. Amen. And if we end there, you and I are lost. We're lost because God wants to give us something for free. Our sins have separated us from Him. And although He loves us, we can't please Him because there's a divide between me and Him. He loves me, but He must judge sin. He can't break His laws. His law says the sin that souls must die. Amen? And if we end there, we are of all men most miserable because we love God and we have no way to come to Him. But there's a fourth pillar. And the fourth pillar is Jesus. Amen. The Bible says in John 1, 1 and 1, 4, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Isn't it beautiful? That in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And He who is God condensed Himself and took on the form of a person and got born into the womb of the virgin mary beautiful isn't it that god to save us where we couldn't get across the divide that was separating us from a holy god he himself says i'll build the bridge and my son will do it in his flesh and i'll send him to do it for me amen Beautiful, hey? Isaiah 53, 6. Let's read the next part of that. We all of sheep have gone astray. We know that, right? We've turned each one to our own way. There's that nice, beautiful word again. But, when I see but, you know what I see? I see the love of God for us. But the Lord has caused the wickedness of us all, our sin, our injustice, our wrongdoing, to fall on Him instead of us. When Jesus was crucified on that old rugged cross, on Golgotha, on Mount Calvary. There was a moment 
there was a moment where spiritually the father took the sin of all mankind that were, that were past, were, and would come. Took that sin, spiritually took it, and emptied it on proper his son. Put it on him. And understand how God is love, but he cannot smile and agree with sin. And when he put the sin of the world on his son, what happened? He turned away from him. Because for the first time ever, Jesus says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because God can't smile at sin. He can have no communion and fellowship with sin. And for the first time, there's a severing between the Son and the Father. As the Son carries sin. I know it might sound strange, but Jesus said it. Why hast thou forsaken me? And there my sin, that I should carry the punishment for, gets placed upon him. And he carries the punishment for it in his body at Pilate's whipping post and upon the cross. He carries the sin for me. What did the Bible say? The soul that sins shall die. What does the Bible say? Everyone that is placed upon the tree is accursed. And what happens? Jesus who was sinless becomes the sin offering for us. His soul that knew no sin carries the sin because I sinned. And he becomes accursed for me that I should have been accursed. And he's crucified to the tree. Isaiah 53, 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our wickedness. Our sin, our injustice, our wrongdoing. The punishment required for our well-being fell on him. And by his stripes, his wounds, we are healed. Amen? Beautiful, isn't it? Well, I, I, just, I want to read it again. Keep your attention with me. I want to read it again. The gospel is, 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 is beautiful news. Gospel means good news. It's beautiful news. Listen quickly. When the Ark of the Covenant came into the city, David danced so much that his clothes fell off. He danced naked because he was excited because the Ark of the Covenant came in. How much more should you and I not be excited when we think about what Jesus did for us? This wasn't an ark carrying things that God had blessed. This was the actual Son of God that came in the flesh. How much more should I not be excited? Listen to what it says. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our wickedness, our sins, our injustices, our wrongdoings. The punishment required for our well-being fell on Him. I have well-being because He carried the price for that well-being. Amen? By his stripes and his wounds, we are healed. Amen? So to be a Christian and to be saved and to be a child of God, I don't deserve it, I don't earn it. More than that, I'm a sinful man and I can't even get to God. When I look at God, He loves me and He wants to bless me, but He can't because I'm sinful. But then Jesus comes. If Kevin owes 50,000 rand for a car he's just bought, and I come to him and I say, where did you buy that car? And he tells me in Nedbank. And I say, give me your vehicle finance number. And I take that vehicle finance number from him. And I go to Nedbank and I pay the full 50,000 rand into the account. And I go to Kevin and I say, you don't owe anything anymore. I paid for it for you. That's the salvation we're talking about. I know it's a strange way to example it. But if you're going with your clothes to the counter and you want to pay for the counter, the man next to you says, God says, I must pay for that for you. And the person pays it and you walk away. What did you do? What did you give? What did you put in? Nothing. The other person put everything in. The other person paid everything so that you can have it. So Kevin takes the car and he goes away. It was paid for by somebody else. That's the salvation that we're talking about. I can't earn it. I can't deserve it. Jesus paid for it. So in other words, the cost of my sin, I had to pay for it because I did it. I smoked, I drank, I swore, I lost my temper, I stole, I lied. It's me, it's mine, I've got to pay for it. But somebody else comes in and says, no, I'll pay for that. You don't have to pay for that anymore. I'm going to take it and pay for it. And he takes it out the way and he pays for it. And it's gone. Amen? And that's what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the last pillar is faith. All you need to do is believe. Listen, how, how is a person saved? How do you become a child of God? By grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. Amen? By grace alone, you don't deserve it or earn it. You could never pay for it. You could never pray enough for it. You could never be a good enough person to be a child of God. 
by grace alone, through faith, I must believe. Believe, even though I can't see Jesus, even though there were no pictures of the cross, even though there, there was nobody there to take a movie of it, and then now I can watch it on my cell phone, I must believe. Because if you acknowledge and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, recognizing His power, authority, and majesty as God, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. If you believe He died for you, He carried your sins and He rose again for you, you will be saved. For with your heart you believe and you are justified. And with your mouth you confess and you are saved. I confess, Jesus, you died on the cross because I'm a sinner. Jesus, forgive me my sins. Let me be your child and let me serve you. Because I believe in you and I know that you are the only way to salvation. I've just said with my mouth what I believe in my heart. And according to this scripture, if I die now, I step into heaven. And if God asks me now why, I'll say because Jesus died for me. And he shed his blood for me. And I'll go into heaven. Amen. Acts 16, 30 to 31. And he brought them out and said, sirs, what must we do to be saved? And the disciple answered and said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You and your household. Amen? This is the last important one. You must believe. Because it's a free gift that's given to you. What happens if I come to my wife and I give her a gift? And she doesn't take it out of my hands. It remains mine until the moment that she takes it. Until the moment she appropriates it for herself. And listen, you can also agree with the gospel. That's like taking the gift but never opening the wrapping to get to what's inside. You can agree with everything I've said, but if you don't take it for yourself, if you don't take it and open it and be a participant in it, if you don't take part in it, then you've, then you've accepted that what I'm saying is true, but you've never appropriated it to yourself. So you've got to listen to what I'm saying, you've got to believe it in your heart, and you've got to confess with your mouth. And if you do that, the Bible says you shall be, you shall be saved. Mark 16, 16. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. I like to believe that this scripture will be written in two places for eternity. On the skies of heaven and on the skies of hell. The scripture will be written. Because it says whoever believes and is baptized shall be saved. And after 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, I'll have no less days to sing God's praise than when I first begun. And I'll look up at heaven after 10,000 years of being in His glory where each moment is better than the one that passed. And I'll look up and I'll see, shall be saved, because I believed. It'll be a promise written there, he who believes shall be saved. I believed and I shall be saved. And those after 10,000 years in torment where the next moment is worse than the one that passed will look up and see written on the skies of hell them that do not believe shall be damned. And it will be written there on the skies of hell. And they'll look up and say why didn't I believe when I had the chance to believe? And the promise will be there I will be damned for all eternity. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves it is the gift of God. Listen. By faith you have been saved through grace. Uh, by grace you have been saved through faith. Amen. It's by grace, but I must believe. John 1 12. But to as many as did receive and welcome him, accept Jesus. He gave the right, the authority, the privilege to become children of God. That is, to those who believe in, adhere to, trust in, rely on his name. That name is the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Amen. So when somebody comes in and they don't know the gospel, that's all you need to explain to them. Five things. Listen, you can't earn heaven, eh? We're not busy with religious stuff. What I want to give you now is a gift of God. And if you'll receive it, God will give it to you. But I need to explain to you that you're a sinful person. And the first step to coming to God is to repent. Repent of your sins. Because God does love you. But God is going to punish sins. And I have some very good news for you. There's a man named Jesus Christ who was the only begotten Son of God. And when He died on the cross, He carried your sins for you, even though you didn't know it. And if you will come to Him, His blood will wash you clean. If you'll confess your sins, He'll forgive you. And if you'll accept this by faith, you'll be a child of the living God. You'll be taking your feet off the road of where you are. And you'll be put on the King's Highway. 
You'll go through a narrow gate and a straight path you'll begin to walk on. And you'll become a, a child of the living God. After we bring them there, amen, after we bring them there, we bring them to a point where the Bible says, very, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of heaven unless they are born again. Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of the water and of the Spirit. Baptism in the water is not for those that have not first come to the gospel. You first have to repent of your sins. You have to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You have to come to Him and believe by faith that you're receiving what was given by grace. That you're not earning it. You need to come. After you've come and after we lead them to Christ, then we tell them, the Bible says, unless you be born again of the Spirit and the water, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Then we tell them, listen, you need to be baptized now. In obedience to the Word of God. Why was Jesus baptized? He had no sin. Why was He baptized? In obedience to the Word. John the Baptist says, you must baptize me. I can't baptize you. Jesus says, no, 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 just baptize me so that the scripture can be fulfilled. Jesus showed us the pattern of how it must be. Even though he had no sin, he was baptized. And what happened after he was baptized? He came out of the water and the Holy Spirit descended upon him. After he was baptized, his ministry began. The baptism is a symbol. Lord, I'm laying down my old life and my old ways. In the same way, I die to sin and I rise to Christ. So when I'm baptized in the water, I die to my old life and sins and I rise in faith to Christ. Amen? Quickly, show of hands. Who's been baptized? Who hasn't been baptized? Okay. If anybody wants to be baptized, come and speak to me. Amen? Baptism is a sign of faith. I believe you must be baptized. Um, and I can speak to you about it more. Amen? I want to read that whole scripture quickly. Jesus answered and said to him, Very, verily I say unto you, which is truly, truly I say to you, except a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. So Nicodemus said, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he the second time go into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered and said, Truly I'm telling you the truth now, I say to you, unless a person is born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen. There's a time when we have to be born again of the water and born again of the Spirit. Amen. So first we lead them to Christ. Then we'll speak to them about the baptism. And we'll bring them to being baptized in the Spirit. Amen.